What the Beep Do You Know About Learning English is a podcast for intermediate to advanced learners of English, and some teachers might find it interesting too. The podcast aims to provide different perspectives on teaching and learning English, and at the same time develop our listeners' English skills. In this episode, we interview Jamie Keddy, teacher, storyteller, and sneezing panda video watcher. We talk about how Duolingo is evil, the dangers of watching English films without subtitles, and an idiomatic expression that includes a haircut and some poo. Okay, let's start rioting. In this segment, we find out about our teacher's origin story or where they got their teaching superpowers from. So, Jamie Keddy, what the beep do you know about learning English? <laughs> Hello, Damien. How are you? Nice to nice. Thank you very much for inviting me to share my my superpowers or knowledge about them. No, it's great to have you on. <laughs> it's a tough one. It's this. It's the most difficult question. What do I know about learning a language or teaching a language? I think the answer is uh, on one hand a lot. On the other hand, very little. <laughs> mm. um, I mean. Um, do you want me to tell you about how I got into teaching first of all, then try and put into words? Yeah, let's uh, yeah. let's go back to the beginning of you maybe with a piano on a cruise <laughs> with one audience member. This is the origin story. Origin stories often um, used for superheroes, right? Yes. Yeah. So I, I was well. It's a long time ago. This is two, the year two thousand. And yeah, I think you I think you know this story, Damien. I was I was playing piano on a, on a ship. This was the end of a long, uh, six long self-indulgent years of studying music <laughs> in the UK. And um, there I was, getting with my dream job, playing piano and singing to passengers on a ship. It wasn't very glamorous. It was a, a, a ferry that went between mm -hmm. the UK and Belgium. And I overplayed. I played too much. I suppose I was too excited. And I <laughs> started getting pains in my arms. Um it was tendonitis, or maybe it was repetitive oh, okay. strain injury. I don't even know if I ever found out, but I was told by the doctor to stop playing for a year. And I went back to Scotland, which is where I'm from, which is where my mm -hmm. parents were, back to stay with my parents. That's what, you know, back in those days, you, you could do that, couldn't you? If things went badly in life, you could just go back to stay with your parents. So I was really pissed off and unhappy, and my mum mm -hmm. said, oh, well, why, why don't you, Jamie? You know, you just put your piano on the side. Why don't you go to Barcelona, it's a place you've always been interested in, and do one of these TEFL courses? And one of these TEFL courses, of course, she's referring to uh, a, mon a one month, um, mm -hmm. well, it was the Trinity Cert TESOL or the Cambridge CELTA, one or the other. It's a generic term, isn't it? And I did, the, yeah. I did one of those in Barcelona in 2001. I always intended to get back to piano playing, but I got bitten by the bug. Was it a very big bug or not? It was a huge bug, Damien. <laughs> one of the biggest bugs I've ever seen. <laughs> Well, I suppose you're still teaching now, so it'd have to be pretty big. <laughs> and it, it moved. I mean, the bug, you know, being a metaphor for the passion and the obsession, mm. perhaps. It's strange that it moved. First of all, it came from, I suppose, the first thing that I was really, really interested in wasn't the teaching. It was the language. Um, linguistics and language and studying English and studying grammar and vocabulary. And then just different branches of, of, of linguistics and um, it, it, it became very interesting and I think maybe quite a lot of teachers go through that. Did you? Yeah, I definitely. Oh, once I got over the fear of being in front of um, students, um, yeah, I wanted to get better as a teacher and I got really interesting. Yeah. I suppose particularly for me was pronunciation and sort of looking at the phonemic chart and stuff like that. I started oh, yeah. to become very sexy for some reason. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? It was almost like an alternative pronunciation offered an alternative to to grammar, which really attracted me as well. And then pragmatics. Once I started studying pragmatics, that was mm. that where where language meets philosophy and and taking it further than that. That was just uh, it was splendid in my mind. But my students suffered <laughs> a lot. 
Well, what do they suffer from? Poor teaching or uh, from uh, too much meta language? Well, everything really. I, my my passion, this bug that bit me, this passion, this obsession. I had. I thought my job as a teacher was to to pass that to to my students, and I would give them what could only be described as lectures and linguistics, which mm. you know, if you're if you're studying in company and you're a you're a, 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 an operator or receptionist at a, a lawyer's firm and you're wanting to learn some functional language to, to take phone calls, I don't think you're really all that interested in lunchtime lectures and linguistics, do you? No, no. <laughs> you just want the yeah. Yeah, meat and potato stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I'd say that, uh, you know, there was a time where um, uh, all my, my students really probably had quite a bad you know the, the classes were questionable but i think you know it's strange i still have some students from back in those days and they they say ah oh, they weren't that bad jamie they, they, we learned things but i i think that perhaps um the fact that the lectures were in english and there were times where i was was teaching the odd the odd, <laughs> the odd word or two <laughs> maybe they just remember that who's to say i don't remember know. the highlights yeah yeah, well, well, it's a, a little bit like as a as a teacher, you spend a lot of time developing and and um, and training yourself, or or, or mm. going on training courses, and and really really putting a lot of energy into getting better. Um, but I think sometimes your your students appreciated you from when you were you know fresh and naive. And, and much less developed than your, you know, your your current self. It's a it's something I've thought about before, and it's a bit of a worrying idea, really. Yeah, that's horrible for all those teachers who are spending all that time and money. Yeah, <laughs> they're getting further and further away from the ideal <laughs> the ideal teacher. I mean, you know, okay, the, so the lectures that I mentioned before, these lectures that I used to give my students, often they were grammar lectures and they were me being blown away by, you know, the, the, what grammar is and, and grammar and meaning and, and getting far too philosophical. But, you know, I think that a lot of them, as, despite sitting in silence, despite not really understanding anything because it was so kind of half-baked, um, I think they still maybe enjoyed those days um, compared with what I do now. Yeah, and with uh, later on uh, in your career, I suppose I first found out about you was more like with uh, video telling, and I always remember the sneezing panda video and connect that <laughs> to you. Could you maybe tell the listeners a little bit about that part of your career? Oh, that's uh, yeah. That I've been, I've been. Um, kind of um, haunted by the Sneezing Baby Panda video, which is to date the most viewed animal video in the history of YouTube. And I am indirectly responsible for the original version being removed from YouTube. Did you know that? No, I didn't know this uh, part of the story. How did that happen? Oh, it's a huge story. I think I think it's a, 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 another, it's such a big story. I think we have to have that for a different day. <laughs> but uh, but if if I will I will be telling this story before too long, perhaps in a, in one of my own podcasts. So um, oh, I look yeah. forward to it. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was a it was the, the sneezing baby panda was very representative of 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 a new kind of in my mind a new way of 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 and and a new how do you put it way that stories exist and stories are passed on and and the story of course being a 16 second um visual narrative of two pandas a mother and a baby and the baby letting out an incredibly high pitched sneeze and the mother um you know getting the fright of her life and this was classic youtube and this was back in 2006 seeing seeing stuff like this was was quite quite important in my life realizing that there's different there's new kinds of content new kinds of stories that are new kinds of interaction with them and um new accessibility on on youtube and and this kind of informed me a lot as a teacher and then as a teacher trainer wanting to use these narratives these visual narratives in the classroom but the big question was was how 
And that's mm-hmm. uh, a question I've been asking myself for 10 years. And I always, I've got a habit of revisiting the same material again and again and again, because each time you you progress some, or get, get to a new, new level of understanding something, you can go back to the artifact or the material, the text again with new knowledge. And so I've revisited the sneezing baby panda about 20 times in my career each time with new new insights if i may use that word i think you could just keep returning to that video infinitely and you'd still you know be slowly taking off another bit of skin off the onion and finding new linguistic uh, gems it is isn't it it's the onion skin analogy keep removing the the different layers and seeing what's down there. So, I mean, that's that's my origin story. And if you're asking me what I know about teaching um, and what's come out of this decade ever since finding YouTube and becoming very interested in visual materials is, is in one word, I would say it's narrative. I mean, I, I think that as a, as a teacher, despite all the things that we think we have to do. My, my, my number one, the way I see my role as a teacher is just providing students with, with, with samples of meaningful, compelling input, language on one hand, and also giving them opportunities to, to express themselves, to communicate with each other, with the teacher. On the other hand, it's as, as simple as that, input and output. Um, it's simple but very complicated at the same time, isn't it? Because there's so much more. <laughs> Your latest project is the fishbowl, which I've been involved in, and some of our listeners I know might be interested in that. What what is what's the fishbowl about? And and if they if someone wanted to join it, how do they get in? Is there a secret handshake or a simpler process? <laughs> Well, to, to 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 tie it together, what I was just talking about, this idea, the teacher's task, uh, in my mind, is to to provide samples of compelling, meaningful, comprehensible input on one hand, and provide students with opportunities to express themselves on the other. And the the word I mentioned before is narrative, mm. um, or or story. I think that story is what provides, in my mind, provides this. Through narrative and through story, I think the language becomes meaningful and compelling. So it used to be visual materials and visual narratives, and now my primary interest is um, organising and structuring lessons through story, stories and narrative. And the fishbowl is um, my membership for teachers that are interested in using story and storytelling in the classroom and want to to develop as storytellers and help their students to do the same and uh, and find out how to do it and why to do it there's lots of videos and podcasts and lesson plans as you as you know Damien and it's yeah. and you're a, you're a great person to have in the membership you're a very you're a great contributor and I have to say I, I love your stories they're they're excellent uh, stories well I'm learning <laughs> learning from the best here Oh, we're all learning. I mean, it is uh, one huge learning process. Um, I learn things every day, and I learn from the members of the in the fishbowl. I learn from you, so it's it's a very that that's that's what a community is all about, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And in the in the blog post connected to this, I'll put it on a link so people can check out um, your website and also the fishbowl and stuff like that. <laughs> Our second segment is called Study Tip of the Iceberg, where we find out our guest's number one language learning tip. Jamie, what's the secret to English success? Stay away from Duolingo. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I hate that green owl. I call that the green owl of doom. It's so horrible, isn't it? I'm I'm in, in Brazil right now and I'm learning Portuguese and of course, mm. I, I'm on Duolingo, and it just annoys the hell out of me. It's so bad, and the and the way they sell it, as in there, it's pedagogically sound. Uh, it's not. It's bullshit of the highest order. And yet, I still use it. You know, um, but there's people are full of tips. You know, people are mm. people are absolutely full of language study tips. I keep getting this uh, this video come to me, a video advert on YouTube of this girl who. She's a German 
girl. She's a, a very good speaker of English, and she's talking about the mm -hmm. importance of English in the modern world and the importance of studying it. And she's giving all these tips, and I'm just thinking, those are those are shit. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're either incredibly obvious, or they're just they're just crap. You know, uh, one of the tips I'll give you one of the tips that she suggests. So it's, uh, I, I hope you forgive me for starting off in such a negative, no, <laughs> in no, such a negative. Feel free. One of the tips that she gives is the importance of watching films in English, but without the subtitles, which <laughs> I, I think is is in, you've really got to ask. Why? What, what, why? Yeah. And, and she, she'll say, because you've got to improve your listening. Well, how are you going to improve your listening by listening to, to, to films in English, which, you know, tend to be a very difficult. Uh, the, the English that's spoken in films in general, the registers is going to be difficult. The language that comes through from the, yeah, the sure. dialogue is going to be quite tough. If you don't know... The language that they're using, if you're not familiar with the, the words, the phrases, the chunks, the idioms that they're using, how on earth are you going to understand it? You know, why, if why you, you might get a gist, but that's coming from a lot of stuff which is perhaps nonverbal. Uh, but it, you're, you're not going to understand stuff if you if you remove the subtitles. So why is it? I've, I've heard this so many times. and Every time I hear it, it, it annoys me. <laughs> yeah, there are lots of advice ones <laughs> like that. So, so my 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 tip for study. Let me try and be more constructive now. <laughs> would be to take a, a film that you like, which is a, a narrative. Back to that word, it's a story. Let's mm. if you if you like the film, then it's a compelling film. So you're going to understand it. Go with the comprehension. Watch it in your own language with English subtitles. And every time you see on the screen a piece of language that you think, ah, oh, now that's good. Oh, yes. They just said that in my language. That's how you say it in English. That's going to be useful for me. Pause the video and write it down. Make a note of it. And mm -hmm. if you go through a whole film, or at least if you go, went, went through a, an episode of your favorite series on Netflix, let's say, which was an hour long, let's say you made 20 notes or you wrote down 20 utterances or sentences or things that are said in the film um, or the episode and you made 20 so you've got your you've got a piece of paper with 20 pieces of English across it with translations into your own language now that is incredibly valuable and that allows you then to take the, your own duolingual approach, but based on your own language and not worrying about duolingual's um, dodgy offerings. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it makes it a lot more meaningful. <laughs> yeah. So uh, films are an absolutely excellent resource. And for, when I say film, I'm, I'm talking generically. Um, TV, Netflix is a fantastic study aid when you take the subtitles into account. Um, so this idea, you've got to watch films without subtitles. I don't agree. Uh, maybe it may. I know it will help some people. I know that there's some higher beings there, linguistic beings, who are just fantastic at taking and absorbing input and making meaning from it and storing it in their brains in the right places. They only need one meeting of a of a piece of language to store it. I've known people like this, but those are not the those those the, that's not me and that's not the majority of people. The majority of people need things to be taken slowly and, and I for one have never learned a language by sitting in front of a TV and trying to make sense of of completely incomprehensible input. It's definitely about yeah using that technique. I think and yeah, lots of repetition and engaging it in different ways, rather than just the sort of couch potato passive absorption method, which uh, yeah <laughs> doesn't work so well. Can we agree? Can we come together as a, a, and agree that there's nothing to be a, be gained by incomprehensible input? <laughs> yeah, in coverage, you might pick up occasional words, but on the whole, it's probably an ineffective way to spend your time if you wish to become fluent in a language. Um, and also, can we agree how we're going to um, destroy Duolingo? What's the strategy? I don't think we, we can't because people, this um, is the other problem. You, you spend, as somebody who creates and writes and makes videos, I'm sure you, you, you're the 
you feel similar to this you've experienced that you spend your life aiming for excellence mm. only to find that nobody really <laughs> nobody <laughs> gets it. Just the sound of silence. Or at least you or at least you discover that excellence alone is not enough. And then come along some like Duolingo and they provide anything but excellence. And yet they're the most popular language learning app ever. So I don't I, I think you teachers and I know people who have had ideas for creating good apps which would topple Duolingo quite specifically because they offer something good. People are don't seem to be interested in them. So it's strange, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, it's definitely difficult trying to release something that could compete. Well, despite what I said about it, I'm using it right now. <laughs> <laughs> this segment is Language Unmasked. We find out about our guests' own experiences of learning a second language. So, Jamie, could you tell us a bit about your own language learning journeys? Yes, journeys, plural. My first journey was uh, a French journey. That was a school learning French. Um, and uh, my, my French was all right, I think. I was pretty good. And I went to France and I worked. I got a job in a restaurant, uh-huh. well, in the kitchen, working as a dishwasher. And I spent eight weeks doing that. And that was the first time I could ever, my first experience ever with becoming, dare I say it, competent. Um, in a language. Um, that was a long time ago. My French has since uh, abandoned me, but it comes back sometimes after... It comes to me in my sleep sometimes. I scream things in French. Things... <laughs> kitchen French. <laughs> this pig language. <laughs> exactly. And then I and then my second journey was uh, moving to, to Barcelona, where I decided to learn Spanish, ashamedly, I've not got round to learning Catalan, but that's because I wanted my Spanish to be of a better um, level first. But the strange thing is, you know, this is this is me being frustrated again. I I, I did a really good job. I studied. These were back in the days of Duol, before Duolingo. We had to make use mm-hmm. of grammar books and dictionaries and read articles and newspapers, and it was fine. It worked. An hour of study every day for about three or four or five or even six months. After two or three years, my Spanish was good. It plateaued. And it has never been, as I think, I think it's never quite been as good as that since. Now, I've been in Barcelona for 15 years, and you can probably guess that there's a slight, um, I'm, I'm ever so slightly um, frustrated because my Spanish was as good as it was 12 years ago. <laughs> what do you think of that, Damien? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I feel the same with my tie I think it's sort of yeah you hit you feel like you're going well and then it sort of regresses or you hit that dreaded intermediate plateau exactly and and, and it's funny because I, I I think I do have some um competences in Spanish you would say um um tener un don para algo um you have a don for doing something it means you're particularly good at something oh, okay. um I wouldn't say that yo tengo un don para aprender um, idiomas. I wouldn't say I'm particularly good at learning languages, but I would say I'm very good at the first steps up from getting from being a, 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 an absolute beginner to, to, to developing some competences, getting transactional language and taking things from there. But I'm not good at going those further steps, which is to turn yourself into you know, a C1 speaker or even a C2. I mean, my, my Spanish on a good day is, a, is, on a good day, I would say it would, some people would think it's a strong B2, but I think that I'm quite good at fooling them. So that might even be misrepresenting it. Why, why do you think you haven't busted through to those higher levels? I know exactly why. My, my Spanish is often the subject of conversations. and it, The people talk about my Spanish as if I'm not there. When I am there, my, I, I make, I'm famous for making mistakes, terrible mistakes. My, my sister always reminds me of this. For example, we were waiting 
<laughs> we were hmm. we were queuing for a table in a restaurant. It seemed to be incredibly disorganized, and it occurred to me that perhaps there was a waiting list um, for a table. So I went up to the waiter and asked him that question. I said, um, "Perdona, hay una una lista um, de esperanza para una mesa." And the, the waiter looked at me, he kind of smiled, and he said, yes, what's your name? So I gave him my name, and my sister and all my friends are laughing. I said, what's so funny? He said, una lista de esperanza. Jamie, una lista de esperanza. You've just asked, is there a list of hope? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say una lista de espera, a waiting list. Oh, okay. I'll ask for a list of hope, which is quite mm. funny. So you get comedy with it, but it, you know you also get laughed at. And 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 to answer your question again, I'm told matter of fact by everybody that the reason my Spanish has stagnated um, is that I don't practice enough. Now that, if you don't mind me using a swear word, Damien, is bullshit. It's bullshit because all I ever do is practice. All I ever do is talk. All I ever do is make use of of the words and the phrases and the chunks and the, the pre-existing Spanish lexicon that I have. I don't that I use that and I jump from word to word, phrase to word, phrase, and I and I don't learn anything new. And so the mm -hmm. reason it doesn't. Um, it doesn't mature or go anywhere or, or develop is quite simply, I don't study. I don't learn. It's, I've got uh -huh. the output going, but there's no input. And, and that's what it is. And the reason I don't get involved, I don't watch Spanish films. I don't watch Spanish Netflix. I don't do any of these things I've mentioned. I just, I, <laughs> it sounds like a real bad excuse. I just <laughs> don't have the time or the motivation. What do you think yeah, of that? I can I can understand that. I mean, so you you're probably saying you don't what you tell your students, you don't practice what you preach at, at this stage of your Spanish studying. Exactly. At this stage of my Spanish studying, I don't practice what I preach. However, I'm not the one paying to go to Spanish classes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's> so <laughs> if I if I was, um, and my my Spanish is okay, Damien. It's 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 all right. I can. I can, I can communicate. I wouldn't want to say it's fluent because that people have their ideas what fluent is. But I can communicate. I'm competent, and I speak. I'm, I'm learning Portuguese, and uh, and I quite like. I quite like that. I like. Oh, so you got like multiple languages on the board. I'm motivated to learn Portuguese. I, I'm, I like seeing. I like to see progress. I guess that could be the motivation thing. Uh, it's difficult to see progress in Spanish. Now you're up to a. B1, B2 level, it's easy to see Portuguese when you start at zero. And uh, yeah, it's good. My favorite new expression I've learned in Portuguese is, um, is uh, eu, sou, eu sou Nutella, um, or there's eu, eu, eu sou Nutella, or there's um, você é Nutella, or você é raiz, which comes down to a cultural um idea they always mm -hmm. had this this chocolate spread which was dirty and cheap but everybody loved it and then the the, the, the brazilian world the world of uh, brazil rather not the brazilian world <laughs> was introduced to nutella which is expensive and and for connoisseurs and this idea you either have cheap chocolate spread or fancy chocolate spread has kind of entered into the kind of culture of the language and you describe yourself as being um posh and fine Nutella or dirty <laughs> and basic, which is root, um, chaiz, chaiz. So these are things I'm learning, which is quite interesting. I thought, I thought you were saying Nutella, but I was thinking, oh, maybe there's a different word in, in, you know, in Portuguese, which sounds like that chocolate spread. Um, I definitely think I'm, I'm a, a fine Nutella spread, but yeah. <laughs> In its raining swear words and idioms, we find out our guest's number one expression or swear word in English. So, Jamie, where are you going to go with this swear word, idiomatic expression, or a bit of everything? Well, how, how vulgar and crude can I go, Damien? Oh, I do put this on like the 18 plus warning so you can go wherever you want with it as long as it doesn't <laughs> damage your reputation. Uh, well, in that case, I better keep things just a little bit lighter than otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of good uh, 
uh, idioms that I, I'm very fond of involving um, swear words. Um, I'm, one of my favorite ones, I think, is when things go wrong. If a plan mm. doesn't go accordingly, um, you would say, oh, God, it went tits up. <laughs> tits up. And I've always loved that expression. When something goes tits up, it just goes wrong. And I think one of the things I love about it is when I'm playing with language and I'm working with Spanish-speaking people who who are also speakers of English, it translates mm-hmm. very well to tetas arriba. <laughs> it sounds a bit better, actually, in the, the Spanish version. Maybe yeah. that's just the exotic sound of a foreign language. Yeah. But, I, but I think my if I, that's, just, that's just a kind of... Um, I'm just getting warmed up here, really, Damien. I think, I think. Well, if I want to give you a proper, a, a more of a figurative idiom, let's say, than than that. Um, I, I I remember when I was a kid, I used to go to to the football to watch Hearts, Hearts of Midlothian in in, in Edinburgh, one of Edinburgh's teams, and okay. my dad used to take me. And we used to go with me and my dad, and then my little brother would come along as well, and he was at the right age. I remember one day, because my dad was always one of my um, my, my great sources of idioms, was my father, you see, and he used to come up yeah. to the great. I remember the, there was a moment in this match, this football match, when our goalkeeper, can't remember his name, um, but he completely, everything went completely tits up for this guy, because what happened was the ball was ball was passed to him he ran out to to catch the ball but he missed it the ball trickled behind him he went back to get it he managed to pick up the ball just before it went in his own goal which was great then he threw it out he threw it back to back to the one of the opposition uh, members players who then lobbed him he ran that means the book hit the ball over his head he ran back he almost <laughs> collided with the goal, goal post and it was a really bad moment for this goalkeeper he was all over the place, as you could say, and my dad's my dad's um, analysis of this moment of the match was as follows: He said, "God, our goalkeeper sometimes he doesn't know if he's going for a shit or a haircut." So yeah, in that moment in the match, the goalkeeper didn't know if he was going for a shit or a haircut, which I love as a as an idiom. It's so it's so expressive. Two things, two everyday things that we all do, that we all need. One is shits, one is haircuts. They are so different. They couldn't be more different. Okay, they both involve sitting down, but they, they, they're just so different that if you don't know which one you're going to, you're obviously very fucking <laughs> confused. A lot of trouble. And, and a lot of trouble, as was that goalie at that moment on that day. He didn't know if he was going for a shit or a haircut. So um, I think that should be in more course books. That's true. They don't, I mean, a lot of course books don't cover these these sort of ones. I haven't actually heard that one. It must be more uh, English or Scottish idi- idiomatic language. I don't know. It could be Scottish, but I, I, one of the things that you asked me before about what the best way to to improve your your language, I would say another one that I think we're often led to believe is that we have to um, enrich our our language. With, with figurative idioms, with cultural idioms. And I'm not sure it's a good thing to do. Um, I, I, I think there's there's some, you know, we've, we've, if we're talking about idioms, idioms encompasses so much, like to keep a straight face, um, mm. to hold a grudge against somebody, to have an on-off relationship with someone, to be a backseat driver. These are all, I would say, idioms which are, are very useful for uh, maybe for a, a, a strong or for a B1 or B2 speaker, for maybe a B2 speaker. But I think yeah. that the absurd, low frequency, culturally specific idioms are, are, are learning them is not the way to, to learn a language. And it can actually make things bad for you because a lot of language learners think they have to you know, they have to get these idioms into the conversation as much as possible. And it, it, it impairs so have communication. have to try and fit in uh, yeah. a haircut and a shit into their conversation. <laughs> yeah. It can be quite challenging yeah. at times. For me personally, I, I like that sort of, I mean, learning Thai, I always sort of gravitate or move towards 
that sort of language because I for me it's memorable and it's sort of funny to mm. learn it sort of it does offer that window to the culture because there's often some sort yes. of historical connection to it but is it the smartest way to learn a language possibly not in the sense of it's not high frequency and you le- probably won't hear it that often possibly or have opportunities to use it yeah yeah but if it motivates you to learn more than it can be a good thing. I think I think enjoy them and appreciate them, <laughs> um, laugh at them, uh, and 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 learn from them. But I would, all, I would say be very 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 careful about trying to use them. In our final segment, in the red room, which is inspired by Twin Peaks, we get our guests to give a bonus expression. So, okay, Jamie, can you give us your bonus expression? And basically, we'll speed it up or slow it down, and then the first listener to decode it before uh, the next episode by and leaves an, a live audio comment will get a a free prize, which is my um my book. Cool. Well, this is this is a, it's a I, I've chosen this one because a friend of mine here in Sao Paulo um, didn't know it, and I was surprised because I thought it was quite becoming quite international. It's a term uh, or a phrase which I is one of these phrases which has become quite popular. It's probably entered into the, the Oxford English Dictionary dictionary quite recently. Um, but one of the reasons I like it is that people actually use it. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's <laughs> and important. Something, yeah, it's about relationships. It's about relationships. It's like uh, if you have a... If you have a companion, let's say, if you an attractive female companion, and uh, you've got your hopes <laughs> for moving to the next level, but somewhere she um, makes it known that that's mm-hmm. not going to happen. It could be, it could be from a, a, a you know, it's relationships it doesn't have to be female it's any situation where one person is attracted to one the other one person the other person makes it known that that's not happening in this case the piece of language is that if this happens to you you have been okay does that make sense yes we will we won't discuss it any further so we'll leave it to our guest to try and decode that expression, and I'll also give some uh, extra information about that in the study notes that come out in the following episode. All right. Thanks for coming along today, Jamie, and I think our audience are going to get a whole lot out of this episode. Well, I have to say thank you to your audience for, for listening and thank you to you for inviting me. It's been fun. There's been, there's been laughter. There have been <laughs> swear words. There's been tears. Um, <laughs> I've really enjoyed it, Damien. Thank you very much. Let's do it again one day. Sure thing. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with master storyteller Jamie Keddy. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and leave an audio comment at Anchor to have the chance of winning the prize. Also, head over to www.englishriot.com for bonus material, including how to use some of the English expressions from this podcast episode. Finally, sign up for English Riot's e-newsletter, The Sledgehammer, to get access to the free course, English Rage. See you in episode four where we interview English materials writer Joe Cummins.